Right, so welcome all of you, human scientists and archaeology and anthropologists, first years. Uh, this is your, I assume anyway, first lecture in anthropology, in social anthropology. And so the purpose of this lecture is simply to introduce you to the kinds of issues that anthropologists study, uh, the kinds of underlying ideas that um, drive anthropology as a discipline. For shorthand, I'm going to say anthropology, but in fact what I really mean is social anthropology, and I'll come back to that distinction in a moment. So, I'm Marcus Banks. Uh, I'm the paper coordinator for the Human Sciences and the Archaeology and Anthropology paper that you're all taking, for which these lectures form a part. But you will also have lectures from my colleagues, um, both within anthropology and um, from some who are lecturers and curators here in the Pitt Rivers Museum, as well as being lecturers in anthropology. During this first year, our main aim is simply to teach you <coughs> anthropology in its own right. Both cohorts of your students are on multi- or interdisciplinary courses, and in the second years, you'll, second and third years, you'll be encouraged to look for cross-connections between, on the one hand, archaeology and anthropology, and on the other hand, between biological science and social science. But we appreciate that often many of these subjects are brand new to you, certainly in the case of social anthropology, and therefore uh, we're just going to teach it, as it were, straight, while making occasional nods and cross-references to the other disciplines that you'll be studying this year. The basic outline of the course is 16 lectures, eight this term, first four to be given by myself, second four by John Landman, uh, and then a further eight lectures next term, plus for the archaeology and anthropology students, normally eight tutorials. Uh, for the human science students, um, normally four to six tutorials, because of course you share this paper with uh, human geography component. And try as we might, it is not easy, in fact, frankly, it's not really possible, to get a perfect correlation between the lectures and the tutorials. So you may find that you have a tutorial on a particular topic, <clears throat> and a lecture relating to that topic doesn't actually happen until a week or two later, or vice versa. Uh, so you're going to have to do a lot of sort of holding things in your head ready to put them together uh, in the vacations when you have time to reflect, go over your notes, do additional reading, etc. Which reminds me that for this lecture, as for all my lectures, uh, I finish with a selection of reading. The readings I give in my lectures are just the references I used when writing the lecture. Uh, they're not obligatory, you don't have to rush out and read them. But if you want to follow anything up, as it were, find the verbatim <coughs> source from which I took the information, uh, then the references are there for you to chase things, things up in the Tyler or here in the Balfour Library. Okay, so what is anthropology? Dictionary definitions usually revolve around something to do with the study of man or the study of mankind. Um, have you noticed the kind of implicit gender marking there? term we will come back to between marked and unmarked in a future lecture, whereby man is the, uh, the core category which is then differentiated into man and woman, so there's a linguistic marking of a subcategory. Um, but even as it stands, study of man or study of mankind, that's a, not a terribly helpful definition. I mean, a whole bunch of academic disciplines could, in one way or another, be considered the study of mankind. And as this term progresses through the lectures and through your tutorials, you'll have a greater sense of the particular kind of contours and defining features of anthropology as a discipline. But what about these um, adjectival descriptors, social anthropology, cultural anthropology, biological anthropology, etc.? Often these reflect nothing more than historical processes. That as different branches of anthropology come into being or become sort of sedimented, you know, I myself, for example, am a visual anthropologist in some contexts, uh, so we use a new kind of qualifier to distinguish that branch of anthropology off from others. The main one, I suppose, to note is the difference between social anthropology, sometimes also called cultural anthropology, which is what I do and what these lectures are all about, and biological anthropology, which is much more concerned, as the name would indicate, with biological processes. Uh, in America, it tends to be known as physical anthropology, a label we seem to have dropped in this country in preference now for biological anthropology. The other distinction between social and cultural anthropology was sometimes reflective of a distinction between North America and the rest of Europe, Australia, etc., 
Um, Americans tended to refer to what they did as cultural anthropology. The rest of us tended to refer to what we do as social anthropology. That distinction is now largely meaningless. Um, again, if you look into the history of anthropology, you'll see that certainly in the period before and after the Second World War, British anthropologists were very much concerned with social structure, whereas American anthropologists were more concerned with cultural form. Um, but again, that distinction didn't really hold fast at the time and certainly doesn't hold true today. So for my my advice is to take the two terms, social anthropology and cultural anthropology, as more or less synonymous. Don't sort of worry about whether there's some subtle difference or distinction that's eluding you. And then, of course, as I say, as the discipline has grown and developed by the end of the 20th century, we're seeing all sorts of sub-disciplines, linguistic anthropology, medical anthropology, visual anthropology, material anthropology, and so on and so forth. And these simply <coughs> reflect a particular focus on something such as, in my case, the visual, but without letting, losing sight of the core notion of anthropology itself. Okay, I brought with me, but I'm not actually going to read out in any detail, the syllabus descriptions from the two degrees. Um, they read largely as a collection of topics, um, which, for example, each topic might be the subject of a lecture or a tutorial. Um, world civilizations and peoples, including cross-cultural, power-based, and gender perspectives on social practice and theories of human life. <laughs> Specific topics include, the production and, include production and consumption, transaction and modes of exchange, elementary aspects of kinship and marriage, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> I've never actually tested this, but I, just off the top of my head, would find it very difficult to think of an area of human activity that an anthropologist has not studied, or at least in theory could not study. Uh, it is very hard for me to think of something that people might do that would have no interest for an anthropologist. Um, and that is reflected, if you like, in the syllabus descriptions. All these different topics, kinship, transactions, exchange, and so forth. Basically, all spheres of human activity are of interest to an anthropologist. The more important question is, therefore, given that we could study more or less anything, what makes anthropology distinctive? One of the main differentiating factors between anthropology and some other social sciences, particularly, let us say, psychology, is that, and this sounds a bit weird, anthropologists are not very interested in people. That is to say, we're not interested in individual men and women. We are interested in the connections between people. Anthropology, as with sociology to a large extent, is the study of social relations. In a sense, the one thing an anthropologist couldn't study is one person. You could mine them for information about their biography and past, their memories and experiences of uh, social relations. But in a sense, we are locked in a room, kind of white cube, <clears throat> with a single human being about whom we know nothing and perhaps can't speak for some reason I can't think of. There isn't really much for an anthropologist to do. It's only when people get together, start forming bonds and alliances, that anthropologists become interested but luckily, people form bonds and alliances all the time, so there's plenty of stuff for us to, to study. We're also interested, comparatively, in the different forms of social bonds formed between people in one kind of society versus people in another kind of society, or sometimes people at one historical period versus people at another historical period. Anthropology is generally qualitative in its approach, that is, not quantitative. We don't tend on the whole to count things. We, don't do, we do do surveys sometimes in a loose kind of way, but we certainly don't uh, gather large data sets based on very large numbers of people and then subject them to statistical analysis. Uh, we favour the intense, intimate, but of necessity, rather narrow focus on a small group of people rather than very broad surveys of very large numbers of people. I'm not really defending <coughs> that approach or attacking any other approach. It's simply that anthropology forms a kind of, uh, ha has a kind of sympathy with other disciplines that we can use the data sets generated by mass surveys as a way of providing, as it were, broad contours uh, and understanding of society into which we can then slot our much more fine-grained, nuanced understandings of the people that we studied. The other thing that anthropologists do, all anthropologists, kind of all the time, 
is think about classification. We classify, we as anthropologists classify people and have done historically, especially into different kinds of societies, hunter-gatherer societies versus pastoralist societies versus industrial societies, for example. But we're also, perhaps more so today, interested in how people classify, people in the world classify things. Uh, if you like, the world could be perceived by some extraordinarily external observer, some Martian or whatever, as some sort of undifferentiated whole, full of stuff. What we are interested in as anthropologists is how the people who live in that world then break that stuff up. For example, many societies make a very sharp distinction between people you can marry and people you can't marry. And that doesn't appear to be based on any kind of biological rationale. It's certainly not based on any other kind of external or observable, measurable factor, like you can only marry tall people, not short people. There's no such marriage rule as far as I know. Rather, people classify and divide themselves into different kinds of people <clears throat> based on and reflective of the nature of the social relations between them, not on, as it were, external, objective, <coughs> objectively observable factors. People also divide the world up into good people and bad people, into people of my religion and people of other religions. There's all sorts of ways in which people classify themselves and others. And at, at root, that is one of the major projects of anthropology, to study forms of social classification and then to make comparative studies. Why in this society does this category of people come into the people I should marry category, whereas in that society <coughs> either is a different category or no such category at all? For example, in our own society, and when I say our own, I mean kind of normative, middle-class, white Euro-American sort of model, we don't have any prescriptive marriage categories. There's nobody we must marry. There are various people we can't marry, but there's nobody we have to marry. Whereas in some other societies, at least historically, there have been both categories. People you cannot marry, should not marry, but also people you should marry, must marry. And so again, anthropologists might look for correlations between these kinds of marriage rules and other kinds of social practices. To give another example of how anthropology might differ from other social sciences, let's take very briefly the example of suicide. <clears throat> in many conceptions, or many ways of thinking about it, suicide could be considered the supremely individual act. A single individual, go back to my hypothetical human being locked in a kind of white cube room, that person can make a decision to take their own life and, given the necessary conditions, follow that through. Therefore, you would think, and correctly so, it would be a matter of great interest to psychologists. What are the particular aspects of the human psyche, what perhaps are the particular events in that person's biography that led them to the point where they wanted to take their own life? What, in a sense, therefore, could an anthropologist... Why would an anthropologist would study suicide? What, what, what could they hope to gain from such a study? Well, in the 19th century, the founding father of both anthropology and sociology as academic disciplines, Emil Durkheim, did precisely that and looked at rates of suicide. In a book, strangely called Suicide, published in 1897, where he found that though each individual takes an individual act to commit suicide, there is nonetheless a patterning. Specifically, <coughs> individuals are more likely to commit suicide, or the rates of suicide at that time, at least in the 19th century, were higher in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe, which Durkheim correlated with the greater prevalence of Calvinist Protestantism in Northern Europe versus Catholicism in Southern Europe. And he argued that the nature of social relations inculcated by or inculcated within Catholic societies, where there are a strong degrees of dependency stressed between family members, between individuals and priests, where the priest acts as a mediating role between God and people, because there were stronger social ties or a stronger understanding of social ties, it was harder for individuals to break those ties. Calvinism, on the other hand, the great sort of Reformation, was all about dispensing not only with the priesthood, but making the individual wholly responsible for the salvation of their soul in that particular formulation of Protestant Christianity. Therefore, Calvinism posits a world in which you are alone. Nobody can help you achieve salvation, only your relationship with God. 
and or Jesus can do that for you. And Durkheim argued that that kind of sense of what he called anomie, <coughs> of social displacement, of not feeling strongly bonded into society, therefore made people who might have sort of psychopathological tendencies to commit suicide, it, it made it more likely it was going to happen. That is, if you like, it is harder to take the psychic step to commit suicide in a Catholic society than it is in a Protestant, and especially a Calvinist society. So there is, from a sociological point of view, actually something to be gained by thinking about suicide rates and patterns across a broad sweep. That in itself, however, is not an inherently anthropological understanding, or not a particularly anthropological insight. Uh, it's a, a mere kind of statistical, uh, statistically manifest uh, pattern. What an anthropologist might be interested in, however, would be cross-cultural patterns or cross-cultural variations. So, for example, in Japan, I am reliably informed by a colleague of mine who's an anthropologist in Japan. I've never actually set foot in Japan myself. Uh, in Japan, there is a concept of mother-child suicide. Now, who can tell me what is wrong with that statement? It's not suicide if she kills her child? Yeah, basically, the child can't commit suicide. Well, could, but doesn't. If the child doesn't commit suicide, what happens is the mother kills the child and then kills herself. In English law, that would be understood as a joint homicide suicide. In Japan, however, it is understood that the child has no uh, independent existence, or no existence, no sense of self independent of its mother. And therefore, the mother commits the act on behalf of both of them. So the Japanese conception is that the mother child bond is to be, or the mother and child are to be treated as a single unit, and, as that, and that unit commits suicide, if you like. Whereas, as I say, in an English or British understanding of this, one person is killed by another person who then commits suicide. So anthropologically, there is some insight, therefore, into what we might take to be the structuring of social life, of family life, etc., in Japan. And there are many studies, indeed, of Japanese families, uh, Japanese child development, child rearing practices, uh, that have sort of confirmed, some have argued the opposite, but mostly confirmed this idea of children as being wholly dependent to the point where, as moral individuals, they don't really exist, wholly dependent upon their parents, and in particular, upon their mothers. Anthropology, therefore, is partly concerned, maybe largely concerned, with alternative ways of being, of challenging normative understandings, just because we just because I, for example, in my society, whatever that is, think that you should worship this kind of deity, get married in that kind of way, raise your children in another kind of way, etc. <clears throat> I tend to absorb those ideas, and they're inculcated into me by my parents, by my society, etc., to the point where I regard them as normative. That's just the way things are. That's the way you do things. Often there's some kind of religious or moral underpinning to that, that this is the best way to do things, the only way to do things, the way to do things that... God or the spirits or the ancestors or whoever approve of. And anthropology, if you like, is a profoundly unsettling discipline because it seeks out uh, other ways of doing things, not necessarily to valorize them and say that's a better way of raising your children or a better way of forming stable marriage bonds or whatever, simply to say there are, uh, there are alternatives. Uh, there have been periods, I won't go into any examples particularly, but there have been periods, for example, in North America where anthropology has been out of favor precisely, or certain manifestations of anthropology, precisely because it says everything is not actually the way you think it is. It's not, it doesn't have to be that way. And in certain conservative periods in North America, that has been profoundly challenging, uh, that children might be exposed to radically other kind of ideas. It is also, for many people, of course, the attraction of anthropology at all, uh, in the first place, that it, it presents alternative life worlds, alternative ways of being. Uh, marriage, for example, is a is um, a good topic. Many of you will end up writing a tutorial on what is marriage. Um, the answer being that <clears throat> there are many, in fact, so many forms of male-female pair bonding or some other kind of very abstract formulation around the world in different societies that it is actually very difficult to settle on a definition of marriage that encompasses all those different phenomena. For example, in many societies, marriage is a not a single event or a single thing, uh, it is a progression. So, that, for example, where I work in India, a marriage is not really complete, it's not really finished until the couple have children. And without children, 
as it were, the marriage process hasn't fully been realised. And it's also worth bearing in mind, going back to what I was saying about the distinction between biological anthropology and social anthropology, that, of course, anybody can mate, and all the rest of the world's <coughs> species do, mammalian species. We could just mate, just have children, just reproduce society that way, or just reproduce the human population that way. And so the big question is, why do we have marriage at all? Why do we have some kind of ritualised, often sacralised, deities are invoked, or ancestors, or spirits, or whatever, way of confirming what is actually otherwise, could otherwise be a purely biological phenomenon. And it's that overlay of so-called culture, or cultural form, on biology, uh, that interests a lot of anthropologists, and I'll give you a, a more extended uh, example in a moment. But it loops back, if we look at the other side of this, back to this idea of, well, what is natural in the first place? What is normative? Are these things just that you take for granted, or are they somehow hardwired, encoded, as it were, that we have no alternative but to behave the way we do with regard to, for example, religious belief? Uh, colleagues of mine in the Institute for Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology, for example, are indeed looking at what might be universal in the human experience of being in the world that, as it were, predetermines a belief in supernatural beings, unseen beings, uh, etc., versus a more conventional social anthropological account, which is, well, most people believe in something, but not for any particular kind of brain hardwired reason. And again, this, that story is currently <coughs> unfolding and evolving, and I hope during the course of the three years um, you'll learn a lot more about it as we go. So what does anthropology do, or do anthropologists do? Purely, not purely arbitrarily, but just for heuristic purposes, for the purposes of this lecture, I divide it up into three areas. Description. Anthropologists typically write long, and you might feel long-winded, accounts of the people that they have studied, uh, a form of writing known as ethnography, writing about others, literally. We're very good at this. We've had a century of practice of writing fine-grained, subtle, detailed <coughs> accounts of lives in other societies, especially trying to bring the reader to a position where they can see the world as the people studied see it. We are good at this, so good that ethnography as a technique, both the practice that I'll come on to, but which generates this form of writing, and the form of writing itself, is actually very much in vogue in a variety of other social science disciplines at the moment. Uh, educational studies, for example, has realised that there's only so much you can find out about children's educational experiences from head counting in classrooms, and are now doing much more observational studies of how children interact with each other, how they interact with their teachers, how they learn to read or learn to make sense of some part of the world that's being taught to them. Um, but this very kind of intimate form of knowledge generation uh, is something that anthropology is very distinct, has as its very distinctive character and is, is <coughs> as I say, much emulated. Explanation. We're okay at explanation. That is to say, okay, so you've now described how these people get married in this particular way, why that bride was chosen over that potential bride, etc., etc. Why? Why did those people do that thing? It was kind of okay at the why questions. During the sort of classic period of, of British uh, so-called structural <coughs> functional anthropology in the 19... well, from that sort of the 1930s to the 1960s, 70s, um, we regarded ourselves quite well on the why front. Uh, the, the reason that the ABC people do XYZ ritual is because it reaffirms their social cohesion, or because it um, provides a way of patterning a society that is played out in uh, land allocation or something, you know, peasant society. We were quite bold about kind of answering these why questions. Why do different societies in the world do the things that they do in the different ways that they do? Uh, there's been a bit of a loss of confidence on that front from the 1980s onwards. Uh, and we seek now, to really, to not so much answer the big why questions, like why religion, um, but rather to, to think about how. We'll just accept religion is there. How do people, as it were, do religion? What we are not terribly good at, it must be admitted, is prediction. If the so-and-so people do X, for example, irrigate their fields in this particular way and land inheritance is arranged in that particular way, what would happen if a new 
high yield strain of wheat was introduced or if women were uh, induced to perform agricultural labour. These are the kinds of questions asked often by development agencies seeking in the post-colonial world to make better in some ways the lives of people who suffer the depredations of drought, famine, etc. How can we make their lives better? Well, the people who understand those lives are quite often anthropologists, so they turn to anthropologists and say, if we did X, introduce this high yield strain of wheat, whatever it is, what would be the consequence? We think the consequence would be, you know, world hunger would be abolished, but what do you think? In the 1960s and 70s, anthropologists did find a great deal of employment with aid and development companies, offering precisely this kind of advice. They quickly realized, both sides quickly realized this wasn't going to pan out. Uh, that anthropology, or not particularly anthropology, society itself is too complex to think about these kind of social engineering problems in very simple terms. Alter variable A here, see consequence B there. Society doesn't work like that. We, all of us here in this room, everybody out there, are autonomous individuals. We have agency, as sociologists and anthropologists will call it. We make our own decisions. And if I come along and say, you're cultivating your rice badly, do it this way instead, you may have 101 reasons why actually you prefer to do it the way you were doing, even though from a, an economist's point of view, it may not be optimal. There may be other reasons why organising labour around rice cultivation makes sense in that society, other than increasing yield. <clears throat> so anthropology tends now to, or anthropologists tend now to kind of stand back a little bit from these kind of predictive um, roles. We offer advice to aid agencies, development agencies, etc. Um, but I think we no longer have a sense that we can solve problems, at least not by ourselves. The other thing, in a more pragmatic sense, of what anthropologists do is we do field work. This is a kind of rather crude uh, sort of diagram of how it all works. We'll come back to this box here, field work. But certainly when we're doing our field work, whatever that is, we rely on the field work of others, who is now a sufficient, as it were, generational depth of anthropological practice, that no matter where you work in the world as an anthropologist, some anthropologists have probably worked, if not exactly in the same place, somewhere nearby by now. And it's a very different position to the early, uh, late 19th century or 20th century, when anthropologists genuine, genuinely were pioneers in the sense of being the first people to think about and study particular societies. Um, nowadays, all our fieldwork is, in a sense, done in the context of the history of all anthropology. We also draw, especially increasingly today, on historical and archival material, uh, reports and records written by missionaries, traders, colonial officials, etc., about the people we're interested in in earlier generations. And we bring all this data, as I'll call it for the moment, back to the office, back to the academy, and begin to perform certain kinds of operations of analysis to order that data, to shuffle it, to start to look for patterns and trends, leading to what I'm doing right now, giving a lecture, publications, other forms of dissemination of knowledge, but increasingly again, there's a moral and quite often a legal obligation actually to return the results of anthropological investigation back to the people that we studied. Um, many, most, I would imagine, all anthropologists even, feel a moral obligation to do this, uh, to, to return to our field sites, to share what we've learned, uh, to disseminate both, as it were, the intellectual findings, but sometimes also practical stuff like photographs we took. Um, <clears throat> but in some cases, getting a permit to conduct anthropological research in other countries requires that uh, material generated from that research is deposited back, at least in that country, if not with the, the community you actually worked with. Uh, so there's a kind of looping <coughs> effect that goes on. So what is fieldwork? Not all anthropologists do fieldwork, it must be said. Some use entirely archival and secondary sources... Uh, to gather the kind of information for the analyses they want to perform. A classic example you'll come across many times in the coming years uh, is the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, who actually did about 10 minutes of fieldwork once when he was <clears throat> in his 20s or something. But basically, his entire career, and he lived to be over 100, uh, was based upon other people's accounts, particularly of, or in one particular instance, of myths. Uh, myths told particularly by North American native peoples, which Lévi-Strauss subject subjected to 
uh, quite sophisticated analysis. And in a sense, it was more efficient for him to work with secondary resources so that he could gather as wide a body of material as possible rather than going and doing field work with a, a huge number of different Amerindian groups, which would have taken most of his lifetime simply to do the field work. On the whole, however, most anthropologists do their own field work, go and live with a group of people for 12 months minimum. Why 12 months? To be able to live, through them, to live with them for all the seasons? Yeah. Um, historically, anthropologists have worked with subsistence peoples or peasant peoples uh, whose lives are very dependent upon the agricultural cycle or at least the diurnal cycle. And therefore, you need to be with them for an entire year, minimum, in order to see that cycle unfold. There may be seasonal rituals connected with harvest or sowing, for example, or certain times of the year when hunter-gatherers hunt, other times when they gather. Um, you need to be with them for at least a year to see that entire spectrum of activity. Less, perhaps, crucial, um, for example, as I've posed, I work in a big city where most people have desk jobs or are shopkeepers. But even still, then, there are, there are seasonal variations. There are uh, religious festivals, etc., etc., punch every year. Uh, we also require linguistic competence, that is, fluency as near as possible as it is to obtain, in the language of the people we work with. Again, why? Because sometimes in the language of one society, there are things, expressions that cannot be literally translated into another language. Yes. There is some degree of untranslatability about language. Many anthropologists, of course, especially in the early days of their fieldwork, will work with interpreters. But certain turns of phrase, certain concepts, may simply not be readily translatable, if that's a word, um, such that it's not really until you have yourself a linguistic competence in the language of the people you're working with that you can begin to spot those subtleties, those culturally specific idioms and ways of using language. Uh, the other reason, rather more pragmatically, for being linguistically competent is, of course, you can overhear things. Um, it's fine working with an interpreter, but all, you can only ever ask questions and receive answers. You can't really take part in a conversation or sit on a bus and listen to what people are chattering about until you speak and understand that language. And we're very concerned, as anthropologists, with, as it were, informal knowledge, informal ways of representing people's understandings of the world. So not the answers to direct questions, what do you think about, or should you plough your fields this way or that way, but rather by observing what happens when people just get on with things by themselves and talk about it by themselves. Uh, the other reason for concentrating on language is, um, well, not the other reason, but another aspect of concentrating on language is the things people don't talk about. Now, might not talk about them because they're tabooed things, dangerous things, things that should not be mentioned. But they could equally as well be things they don't talk about because no one would want to know. No one needs to know. They're such common ideas that they're almost never expressed in language. I mean, why would you... You're all new, actually, the vast majority of you. I expect you are, at the moment, all talking about what it's like being a student in Oxford. And you're swapping experiences and sharing anecdotes and all this kind of stuff. Within a year or so, that's going to tail away. You'll just, you'll just be students in Oxford. You won't need to keep talking to each other about it. Um, and therefore, if I, as an anthropologist, was working with Oxford students in their third year, there's a whole lot of stuff about being a student that I would simply miss because you simply wouldn't talk about it because you have such a shared experience. There's, no, there's nothing to add to that. Which brings me on to another point. Anthropologists very quickly realise that not everybody knows everything. This idea of partial knowledge. We try to work with small numbers of people because of the intimacy, <coughs> the, the, the constant interaction with people that allows a degree of uh, familiarity and intimacy to develop, whereby people feel relaxed talking about things with you. But we still need to talk to a fairly wide range, range of people simply because not everybody is going to know everything about their society. Which is true, of course, of, of ourselves. I mean, I... I'm actually a bit crap at economics. I don't really understand banking, for example. So I'm quite happy to go out on the marches and wave the placards saying down with the bankers. But I actually don't really understand what they do. I don't understand how the economy works. But I can still go into stores and buy things. I have a bank account. I write checks. I make payments online. 
I can do the economy, I just can't really explain it. I don't, I don't, if you as an anthropologist ask me to explain the British economy, I'd run out of steam in about five minutes. But if you ask me about economic things that I do, I can easily fill the rest of the lecture with that. I can tell you lots of stuff about my economic behaviour. On the other hand, you might then, as an anthropologist, want to go off and interview a banker or somebody to find out their side of the story, what they think is happening in the British economy. So you, as an anthropologist, you often talk to quite, try to talk to quite a r- wide range of people to get different perspectives on the same topic. There's a classic example uh, from the early 20th century of the fallacy of relying on a single source of information. Uh, this is a French... Belgian, French anthropologist called Lucien Levy Brühl, who picked up on an observation made by a German traveller called uh, von Steinem, who was travelling in the Brazilian Amazon and came across a group of people called the Bororo. And von Steinem wrote that the Bororo believed themselves to be macaws. Red macaws, actually. And this was presented as an instance of so-called primitive peoples, and by primitive In the 19th century, what anthropologists and others were describing is what they thought to be original or primal forms of social organisation, social behaviour. They didn't mean it in a pejorative sense. It was simply a scientific, fallacious, but what they considered to be a scientific (coughs) term. So primitive peoples, according to von Steinem, and therefore picked up by Levy Brühl, were obviously at such a point of kind of mental or cognitive evolution, they couldn't really tell the difference between people and animals, or, or particularly people and birds. And therefore, they could say, we are, we are red macaws. And this was happily reported, and Levy Gruel uh, made a series of statements about the primitive mind based on this and similar examples, uh, which, again, you will almost certainly be studying in the next term or so. What fatally von Steinem failed to do was to get, to ask further questions, to ask other people. It turns out, subsequently, <coughs> by anthropologists who worked with the Aurora people, in the second half of the 20th century, only men say that they are red macaws. Women don't. It's a matrilocal society. Therefore, men go to live with their wives and their wives' families. Women in Varora society sometimes keep red macaws as pets in little kind of bamboo cages. And therefore, when men say, we are red macaws, what they are doing is using, amazingly, irony and describing themselves as like pets because they are so much dominated by their wives and their wives' families in terms of social organisation, economic behaviour, etc., etc. They're not saying we can't tell the difference between people and animals. Um, so, again, the, the length of time an anthropologist stays in the field, the, the variety of people that an anthropologist talks to and works with and experiences life alongside, all contribute to a much more nuanced and one hopes more accurate understanding of lives in those societies. Okay, I want to conclude with a more detailed example um, to think through some of these ideas, both about what is natural, what is given, versus what is socially constructed, uh, what people think, what people are saying, what the anthropologist who's listening to them thinks they're saying, and so on and so forth. And this is the so-called virgin birth debate, which is slightly misnamed, but um, it's acquired this name, that's how it's known in the literature. Um, reflecting, of course, uh, the biblical story of uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, giving birth to Jesus, apparently through divine, or solely through divine intervention, uh, without having had sexual intercourse with her husband. Hence, she bore a child while still technically a virgin. Before we get on to it, I just want to take a little side route down uh, another aisle in the supermarket of anthropology that we will be uh, exploring in future lectures. This is a pioneering piece of work in 1909 by, and he really is Belgian, I remember this one, Arnold van Gennep, uh, called Les de Passage, The Rites of Passage, where van Gennep conducted a survey of rituals by which people, part of, sort of based on available information in travellers' reports, other anthropologists' accounts, etc., rituals in which people appear to make a transition from one social status to another, for example, from single to married, or from living to dead, or from child to adult. He very quickly realised through this survey that one should be careful to distinguish biological time from social time. 
A good ex- there are many societies that have examples, but we ourselves, or Euro-American society, provides uh, an example in the sense that we have legally, in different countries, in Europe and, and North America and um, the OECD world, in fact, the global world, actually, we have a, a, a specified age at which adulthood is attained. There may be several ages, um, there may be a single age, but there is an age before which you cannot vote and an age <coughs> after which you can vote. There is an age before which you cannot marry or indeed have sexual relations, and there is an age after which you can, and so on and so forth. Your own career has been punctuated by this in terms of your schooling, the age at which you must go to school, the age at which you can go to school, the age at which you transition from one type of school to another type of school, etc. Now, clearly, these are standardised stratification techniques. They apply to all of you. When you, at least in Britain, when you turn 18, you can vote. That may be that you're actually deeply immature and are going to vote for the Monster Raven Looning Party, or you're deeply sophisticated and you're going to vote for you know, the radical socialists. The point is, the age that society confers upon you, or rather marks as the transition from your being, in this sense, kind of adolescent to an adult, is completely independent, or largely independent, of you as an individual and your biology. We all know people who are at the age of maturity, uh, that is the legal age of maturity, who are childish and silly, and people who are well below 18, say, who are mature and grand <coughs> in, in their selves, as it were. So Van Genep realised that there had to be something going on. Societies were enforcing forms of social practice that were supposedly about <coughs> age and duration of biological time, but actually had more to do with what society wanted to tell itself than what was material or relevant for the individual. So, for example, many East African pastoralist societies, those are cattle herding societies, have so-called age sets, where all the young men, in biological terms, between, it varies, but say young teenage to mid-twenties, are grouped together as a single age set and progress through life as a cohort of men, regardless of the fact that they're not all actually the same age. And at different points in the age set cycle will acquire different rights and responsibilities. Equally, Van Genet, through his study of all these rites and rituals, noticed that things were being punctuated by social custom, by social ritual, that would just happen anyway. Childbirth being a very good example. I'm afraid, short of abortion or um, miscarriage, once a woman is pregnant, she will give birth. It's going to happen. So why then do all societies that we know of seem to have various kinds of rituals to mark that apparently natural event? It's going to happen anyway. Children are going to appear, grow up, become the next generation. And yet their very appearance is marked by social ritual. Again, it was a way, Van Janet felt, of society reaffirming society for its own sake over and above just being a biological individual, just being a woman who has babies, a man who inseminates women, etc. This is most dramatically seen in an institution known sometimes as the Kuvard, which we see in some uh, Amerindian societies in South America and other parts of the world too, where men, or partners of pregnant women more particularly, experience the symptoms of pregnancy. They experience morning sickness, they experience food cravings, they subject themselves to food taboos, food that you can eat, food that you can't eat, etc., and even in some cases claim to experience labour pains. Now, are they simply pretending to be pregnant, for reasons unknown, or is there a more subtle interaction between biology and society, between biology and culture, that leads them to see childbirth as an action performed by two people, the male and the female, just as they were responsible for causing the child to come into existence in the first place, and that a child who has not had, as it were, a pregnant father who experiences labour pains, is not a fully born child, because it's only been born from one of the party, parties. Um, <coughs> there are other explanations for Kuvard, but again, it gives us this idea that something that's going to happen anyway, it's kind of biological, it's so-called natural, is actually always culturally inflected. In different societies will inflect in different ways. Okay, virgin birth, finally. Very early on, a number of travellers missionaries, colonial officials, etc., uh, working especially in the Pacific, and more particularly in Australia and the Trobriand Islands, which was an island group off the northern coast of Australia, 
claimed to come across groups of people who appeared not to know what the relationship between sexual intercourse, pregnancy, and childbirth was. For example, uh, an early sort of colonial official anthropologist, Roth, wrote in 1903 of a group that he then, at the time, were known as the Tully River Blacks, which sounds desperately kind of disparaging. Uh, we now know them to be the Malambara and Gulnye people um, on, who live on the Tully River in Queensland. came across this group of people, and of them he says, a woman begets children, this is what he says they say, a woman begets children because, A, she has been sitting over the fire on what she has roasted a particular species of fish, which must have been given to her by the prospective father, or B, she has purposely gone hunting and caught a certain species of bullfrog. Or C, some men have told her to be in what he calls an interesting condition. Or D, she may dream of having a child put inside her. I, none of which seem to be causes of pregnancy as we would understand them. Equally, Malinowski, uh, who's an anthropologist of whom you'll hear a great deal in the coming weeks, months and years, in 1913 reported from the Trobriand Islands that women claim to fall pregnant after swimming in the sea, during which a certain kind of spirit, known as a baloma spirit, a spirit of a maternal ancestor, enters her. Now, in these and many other similar accounts, the, the general understanding seemed to be from the, those who were reporting these uh, beliefs was that, again, using this term very carefully, primitive peoples had, putting it kind of, charitably, other understandings of the world. Um, whereas we, that is Victorian scientists, had different and probably, to be honest, better understandings of the world. So we understood the relationship between sexual intercourse, pregnancy and childbirth, which we knew to be correct. Um, whereas these people, like um, the Trobriand Islanders uh, or the Malambara people, somehow had failed to work this out. And that became, if you like, a little puzzle. How come they'd failed to work it out? So what are we to make of this? Firstly, Malinowski, having written in 1913 about Baloma spirits and women swimming in the sea, when he actually went to the Trebriand Islands a year or so later, uh, subsequently wrote in 1937 uh, a slightly modified account. He said, the so-called primitive ignorance, and again using primitive in this supposedly scientific neutral way, Suppose so-called primitive ignorance of paternity, that is to say, not recognising the role played uh, by the male in inseminating the female, is nothing else but a very imperfect knowledge that intercourse is a necessary, though not sufficient, condition of a woman being opened up, as my Trobrian friends put it. Now this phrase, necessary but sufficient, or not necessary, <coughs> necessary though not sufficient, is, for those of you who have ever studied philosophy, a key concept. That something happens is necessary, but does not necessarily, necessarily result in a particular outcome. This, of course, is true of the Western scientific notion of conception and pregnancy. Not every act of sexual intercourse results in pregnancy. Indeed, for many couples, uh, it never results in pregnancy. And so in that sense, the Trobriand Islanders weren't perhaps as far off base as originally thought. They knew there was a connection between sexual intercourse, the woman was so-called opened up, but that wasn't a sufficient condition for her to become pregnant. That required swimming in the sea and being impregnated by this Paloma spirit. But there's more to it than that. Even within our own society, or your own societies, whichever they may be, we are aware that there are certain ways that you say certain things in certain contexts that you would not say in other contexts. So, for example, I'm busy giving you this lecture about, as it were, how earlier anthropologists represented what they considered to be failed or, or incorrect beliefs on the part of others. I would have a very different conversation. I would talk about it very differently if I was talking to my partner, who's not an anthropologist and has never read any of this literature and, frankly, I suspect doesn't really care. So I, I phrase what I'm saying in a particular kind of way. It's from a lecture mode as a way of communicating <clears throat> to you as students in a, an appropriate form um, that you will recognise and come across in all other lectures you go to. Equally, when some market researcher stops me on the street and asks me about current government policies towards <coughs> higher education, I will speak about it in 
represent my ideas <coughs> and, and attitudes towards higher education and, let's say, its funding very differently to that market researcher than, for example, with my colleagues when we go to the pub after our Friday seminar and we kind of <coughs> let our hair down a bit, it's the end of the week, and we're much more kind of belligerent in what we might have to say about it. There are different styles of language, different styles of discourse, different styles of oratory appropriate for different kinds of contexts, and that is what Mag Malinowski failed to appreciate. Later work on this so-called virgin birth debate, <coughs> but particularly a contribution by uh, a very eminent English anthropologist, Edmund Leach, in 1966, went back to the original title of this belief, the virgin birth debate, and thought through what is going on in Christian theology, belief, that allows people to think, believing Christians, to consider that Jesus was born of Mary while she was a virgin, and yet not to hold that belief for all other instances of pregnancy. That is to say, believing Christians don't believe that every birth is a virgin birth. In fact, that would rather invalidate the concept. The whole point about the virgin birth for Christians is that it is the only one. It's only ever happened once. It's a singularity. Leach also looked, for example, at transubstantiation, the belief in Catholic and Orthodox Christianity that the blood, uh, blood the bread and the wine at uh, communion, Holy Communion, is transformed miraculously, at this time, every time, into literally the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, even though physically it remains unchanged. Protestants don't believe this, they think it's just a metaphor, but Catholic dogma holds that it really does change in a mysterious, <coughs> miraculous way into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But Catholics, when they're kind of making breakfast, don't think that there's any danger that the mother's pride that's stuck in the toaster is going to turn into Jesus' body. It's, it's kind of context-dependent. So, too, looking back at what these people had said to earlier anthropologists, Leach realised that a number of things about these so-called virgin birth claims. Firstly, that they're only made by men, not by women. Secondly, that Trevor and Islanders and um, Malambara people and everybody else were perfectly well aware about the relationship or the causal relationship between sexual intercourse and pregnancy. If nothing else, as Malinowski himself points out, there's enough animals wandering around that they kind of figure it out, even if they're never actually told. Therefore, when they're making these claims about men are not maybe necessary but not sufficient in causing the birth of children, they're not talking about children as biological beings, they're talking about children as members coming into being members of clans. Turbulent society is matrilineal, kinship is reckoned through female mother to daughter, mother to sister, links. And what men are doing is trying to think through a way in which, or the ways in which, new members of, new generations, new members of society are incorporated socially into society. There's no problem about their biological existence. Everyone knows where babies come from. The problem is, what clan do they belong to? How are they deemed members of that clan? What responsibilities and rights will they inherit? And Leach says... This talk, this talk about so-called virgin birth, business about paloma spirits, etc., is, if you like, a dogma. It's a tale you tell, a, a conventionalised understanding of where people, rather than babies, human social subjects, where people come from rather than where babies come from. Just as transubstantiation, the turning of the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, is a way of talking about one's relationship with the Catholic faith, with the church, with the divinity, etc. It actually doesn't really matter whether you believe it or not, if you're a Catholic, it's more important that you know what you're supposed to believe. Okay, we will come back to the Trebriand Islands in at least one, if not more, subsequent lectures. You will write, I guarantee you, an essay about uh, Trebriand Island of Gift Exchange, you may also write an essay about so-called virgin birth beliefs. Um, but for the moment, I just want to leave you with these sets of ideas. That anthropologists are as interested in what people say about themselves and why they say those things about themselves and why they do the things they do as they are in trying to find out universal laws, universal behaviours, and so on.